a new day in San Antonio. The Spurs secured the number one overall pick in the upcoming NBA draft. With that, they have the right to select generational talent Victor Wembanyama. Here's hoping for their sake that he lives up to the hype. It's Wednesday, May 17th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Sports Emmys are coming up on Saturday, and among the nominees for the Outstanding Personality Slash Emerging On-Air Talent category is someone who had no interest in being a media figure as recently as three years ago. Robert Griffin III, or RG3, saw his NFL career end unexpectedly early at age 30 due to injuries. That end turned out to be very much a new beginning for him, and now he has found that he not only has a knack for media, but he has huge ambitions there as well. I'm now very excited to welcome ESPN analyst and former NFL quarterback, Robert Griffin III. Welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you having me on. How you doing? Doing great. Great. Great to have you. So, um, so you know, you retired from the NFL in 2020, but uh, you have not left our, our screens. So what made you want to get into TV analysis? Honestly, I, I did not want to get into TV analysis. Um, this is something that uh, kind of happened out of nowhere. Uh, my broadcast agent, a guy by the name of Mark Lepselter, bothered me for three years while I was playing in Baltimore, telling me that he thought I could, you know, I could do this and I could do it at a high level. And I just <laughs> kept telling him I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I had no interest um, because of some of the things that had happened in my career with uh, people on TV talking about me in a certain manner that that wasn't accurate with who I was or, or the situations that were going on. I just didn't want to be a part of that. So, I mean, 2021, I was a free agent. And he continued to bother me the entire off season. So I did an audition, got into it, and realized that this was a real opportunity for me to make an impact in a way uh, that would be very reflective of how my career went. As in, hey, I didn't love uh, how I was mischaracterized, so I make sure I don't mischaracterize people. I didn't love how some of the stories that were told about me became personal, so I make sure the stories that, that I tell about these players are not personal. And being a, a storyteller and, and telling these guys story the right way is something that is very important to me. And I think that's why that you have the respect of the players uh, and the respect of the fans uh, moving forward in this industry uh, has been phenomenal because I've approached it in that way. And I, I want to dive into all that in a moment. But were there any particular incidents that you remember from your playing career where it felt like the media just got it wrong about you? Um, yeah, I mean, just a lot of the story, the stories that were coming out when I was in DC with the with the uh, Redskins at the time, now the Commanders, um, just weren't true. And I just wanted to make sure that as a as a broadcaster now in this role, that there's no way for me to go back and debunk all of those things or to go back and try to to get the right story out there. All I can do now as a broadcaster is get the right story out there for the players, right? Get the right story out there. Uh, for the organization with what what is going on and how things are being handled and and give my analysis the way that I should. Um, So this is kind of a way for me to give back to the game, to give back to the fans uh, in the right way. And I was very, uh, I'm very excited that I initially took that first audition because now uh, the future possibilities are endless. Yeah. And how quickly did you know that this is something that Actually, yes, you do want to get into this. You do have a talent for it and and you can make an impact. Was that pretty quick? Oh, man, I don't know. I, I, I never looked at it in a way of like, man, I could really have an impact here. <laughs> I, I more so went into it blind with the auditions. And it was the reception that I got back from the TV executives that made me realize, OK, there is a there's a future here. I don't know how good I'll be at it, but there's a future here. And I was calling a game with Mark Jones uh, as my play-by-play and Quint Kessenick and our crew, our producer in my ear, a guy by the name of Kim Belton. They're phenomenal, right? They're my mentors in this whole thing. And we're calling a game between Texas Tech and Houston in 2021. And this is one of of my first games. And the guys are out there on the field in pregame. And we call the first drive of the series. And we we go to a commercial break. And I started crying in the booth. Now, they didn't know that. They didn't know I was crying in the booth because I, I hit it. But I started crying in the booth because I missed the game so much. 
right? Playing the game, seeing the reads the quarterback was making, seeing how the team was reacting when good things happened or bad things happened, like the camaraderie of being on a football team. I missed all of that and missed that part of the performance. So it was at that moment I made a decision for myself that I'm going to pour all that passion that I have for the game into these broadcasts. And I think people resonate with that. They feel that excitement. They feel that passion um, and through the broadcast and through the screen when we're doing them. And, and it's for that reason. I just love the game of football and want to give it up my all. Do you still miss it, playing? I mean, there's nothing like playing football. You know, I'd play football for over 20 years of my life. So, you know, I am a guy at 33 years old who I continue to train every single day. So if that call does come, I'm ready to go. But as I have told many people, you know, I'm a plan A guy. Everything is plan A, multiple plan A. So I want to be the best I can possibly be in the broadcast booth as an analyst, as a journalist. I want to be the best I can possibly be as a father, as a husband. Uh, I want to be the best I can possibly be as a player if that call comes. But I never let one plan A detract from the other plan A. We're doing them all at the same time. And I'm having fun right now. Mm -hmm. Um. You were very excited. Uh, it was, I think, you got they got your reaction live on ESPN to see that the Washington Commanders had been sold to a group led by Josh Harris. Uh, that's, of course, your you know your former team. Uh, what was the biggest reason for you to to celebrate the ownership change? Oh, I'm, listen, this is the, the fans I know are extremely excited uh, about this sell the team, and and the reason is there's been two decades uh, of dysfunction with the team. Uh, and I think when you look at the ownership group, you know, led by Josh Harris with Mitchell Rails and Magic Johnson in there. I mean, these guys are our bona fide, certified, you know, lifter ups of, of organizations that they've been in. Josh Harris, you know, turned around the 76ers. He turned around the New Jersey Devils uh, in his ownership tenure. Magic Johnson, uh, you know, owner of the Dodgers. He owns the WNBA's L.A. Sparks and, and just won a championship with uh, Los Angeles FC of the MLS so I think the fans, that excitement for me comes more so from what is in, anticipated to happen with the commanders moving forward. That dysfunction doesn't just rub off on the fans. It turned it turned fans away for sure, but it rubs off on the players. Every day they go in the building, they're having to deal with a different distraction. They don't really truly get to focus on playing football and diving deep into their community. Um, so when you when the fans leave, obviously the sponsors start to leave as well. So. Dan Snyder selling the team marks the beginning of something new, not just for the fans, not just for the players, but for the city and for the entire organization, that they can build something greater into the future. And I'm excited about that, man. I, I, this team uh, changed my life forever the day that I was drafted. And I, I want the, what's best for the team. I want what's best for the organization and the players that are playing there. So that's where that emotion came from. Yeah. And I don't want to linger on the past too much, but what was a way that you felt that dysfunction when you were the quarterback? Uh, I mean, when, when you're the quarterback of the team, I think one of our most icon, our, our infamous games was uh, is a snow game against the Kansas City Chiefs. And I mean, I played terrible in that game. We, we as a team uh, got blown out so bad. It was almost as if, you know, one side, I think one side of the field had a ton of snow on it. It was our side of the field uh, as far as the side that we were driving on because we didn't even cross midfield for mo the majority of the game. And But what's lost in translation is that before that game, there was a report that came out by my buddy now, Adam Schefter, uh, describing that the the head coach had given up on the team and, and uh, had done some different things. Uh, in the media or with the team or with the owner, some infighting, something happened. And the players saw that before the game. And that was disheartening because this is a game that these guys are playing. We're all playing to support our families. We love this game of football. And when you see that and that the infighting between the, the, the coach and the owner, uh, it, it didn't inspire anyone to go out there and play the game at the highest level. We already have a, a tough task because the players that we're playing against are the best in the world. So when you pile on to that and, and now as a team, you know that there's something going on, um, it leads to efforts like that. And I just felt like that's that's not what you want as an organization for your players. It's not what you want uh, for your coaches uh, or for your fans. And I think moving forward, the fans won't have a reason uh, to to pull away their money from the team or pull away their support from the team 
because they're going to get a group that has ties to the D.C. area, a group that understands the importance of community. I mean, look what Magic Johnson's done with the funds that he's created uh, in the urban areas of L.A. alone. And, and Magic's from PG County. So I just think that everything that happened in the past, it, that happened in the past. And this signifying moment for Dan Snyder selling the team is it allows the fans to move past that chapter and into a greater one. Up next, we hear some of RG3's boundless ambitions in the media world, and I ask him what he would do if he could make one change to the NFL. We'll have the rest of our conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash front office. That's netsuite.com slash front office. Schefter is probably the biggest example of this, but have you had conversations with folks who are now your colleagues in the media about, you know, what, what it was like being on the other side of that, being the one being reported on, having the team being reported on, um, and now getting to, to talk to those, those folks, um, you know, as, as a colleague, but as someone who's been on both sides? I, I would say this. Those conversations, uh, for me, more so happen with guys who are trying to get in the industry now. And, and I say that and I kind of laugh because I've only been in the industry two years. But because of the success that we've been able to have with the college football games and Monday Night Countdown, there's been countless guys reaching out to me asking, you know, how can they get in? Or if it's a young guy like a sauce gardener uh, that, that says, hey, you know, how, how is the industry? They're more so asking me those questions because of what you just asked. The one thing that I know that you can't do in this industry is try to police other people. I can't police what anyone else is trying to do or what they're trying to say. But if I'm on air and I hear something that I think is out of bounds or I hear something that I think is the wrong direction, then I do have a responsibility to, to myself and to the, the person who the story is being told about to try to steer that in the right direction. And that's more so how I approach it. Uh, you know, Adam Schefter has been in the business for a very, very long time. He is the top uh, insider at ESPN for a reason. He's got countless relationships. I, I don't have those conversations with Shefty. One, because he doesn't have time to have those conversations. He's always breaking some more news. And two, at the end of the day, me and him working together has nothing to do with what uh, was said in the past or what happened in the past. My job is to be a good teammate to him. Uh, his job is to be a good teammate to me. And, and that's what, the way that we operate it. And I, it's been a blessing. Uh, working with guys like Adam Schefter and, and Booger and legends like Susie Culber and, and Steve Young uh, on that set. It's been really cool to get to know them as people and, and really present the game uh, to the fan with them on Monday Night Countdown. And speaking of the success you've had, you're nominated for a sports Emmy. Uh, what did that mean to you to, to get that call? Oh, I mean, it was, it was, it was kind of surreal. Um, at the end of the day, the, the names that are that are on that list that are nominated, the Eli Manning, uh, you know, Greg Olson, I believe it's J.J. Reddick and Andrea Carter uh, as well. Uh, these are it's just an honor to be in the same sentence on the same stage, on the same graphic uh, with all these extremely talented people. But uh, for me personally, it's, it's not possible without the people that I've already mentioned. Uh, you know, Kim Belton, my producer on college football games, Mark Jones, Quint Kessenick, our director on that crew, Anthony DeMarco, uh, our cameraman. I call him the cameraman extraordinaire, BMAC, who goes around at, at all the college games and, and travels with me to go to the tailgates and to talk to fans and do all of the, the fun intros that we do for college football. But also with Monday Night Countdown, like the, the best story that I have is our very first Monday Night Countdown during the season. We're in Seattle. And I went to our producer by the name of Greg Shapiro, and I asked him about four weeks before that, that game if I could race Tamer the Hawk, right? Tamer the Seahawk, who is the mascot for the Seattle Seahawks. And he didn't balk at the idea. He didn't say, oh, no, we don't do that on TV. 
that's not the kind of show this is. Keep that stuff in college. They actually bent over backwards to make it happen. And we did it. I raced Tame of the Hawk, which hawks can fly at about 120 to 140 miles per hour. And I won the race. And it was it was great for TV. People really enjoyed it. And that part of it has just been so fun for me to work with great people who are willing to be daring, willing to go out on a limb and try something new. I mean, I spoke Spanish on the broadcast when we were in uh, Mexico City and wore a stormtrooper helmet uh, <laughs> during the broadcast. Like we have fun and, and the people that I've had an opportunity to work with have truly made this transition from on the field to the broadcast booth uh, a pleasure. Is there anything you want to do as a broadcaster, as an analyst, um, or just like in media more generally um, beyond what you're doing right now? Oh, man. I mean, the possibilities are endless. You know, uh, I've tried to show versatility, you know, not only doing in booth work for calling games, but also doing studio work, uh, get up, first take, NFL Live on Sports Center. Uh, ESPN has truly blessed me to, to do those different types of things and go do feature interviews. Uh, meeting people where they're at, learning about them and being able to present that in a journalistic fashion to the fans. Uh, but when you talk about the media industry, there's just countless opportunities outside of sports in entertainment, whether it's in the movie business. And what I would say is don't close the door on anything. Um, you know, there, there's countless opportunities. I, I'd love to call the Olympics someday uh, for track and field. You know, I was a, a really um, big track enthusiast growing up. Track was was my first love uh, before I fell in love with football. Uh, that would be something that would be extremely fun. Doing movies in Hollywood would be would be something that's extremely fun. You know, doing things with 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 uh, Netflix and and some of the specials that you can do around these other sports would be something that's really fun. But they don't close the door on anything. We got guys like Michael Strahan who have gone from being a sack master in the NFL to doing pregame shows to Good Morning America. And uh, those types of paths are something that I'm certainly interested in and, and look forward to executing those uh, as the years go on. Uh, last question I'll ask you, uh, if you could make one change to the NFL, what, w- what would you do? Oh, my gosh. Well, right right now, I would say the one, the one change I would make with the NFL, um, it really doesn't have much to do with the NFL. It, it more so has to do with our industry as a whole uh, in covering the sport. Um, you know, right now it's an extremely tough time, um, you know, for media, just a lot of people who are losing their jobs. Um, you know, it's an, it's an unfortunate time. And I know that the people that have lost their jobs thus far, extremely talented individuals, uh, I've had an opportunity to work with many of them. And I know that these jobs are like the most important thing for them. So when you see, uh, whether it's in the NFL and the NFL media circle, or if it's at ESPN and there's all these layoffs happening. You know, I want to say first and foremost, praying for all of those people, want them to land on their feet because none of us want that to be happening. But it's also difficult when you see the NFL broker a deal like the one with Peacock where they're making 110 million for one playoff game and then saying, well, we can't, we can't pay the media to, to continue to be able to support their families. Um, We have to, you know, cut back on the amount of people that, that are being paid in those in those regards when there's countless amounts of money that's being made. Um, it's tough. It's very tough. Um, and I, I don't ever look at that. That's never lost on me. But aside from that, you know, unless I, you know, is Roger Goodell going to be uh, getting the re-up as the commissioner? Because if, he, if he's not going to get the re-up, listen, you can make some changes if you're the commissioner of the NFL. That would be an opportunity that I wouldn't, I wouldn't balk at either. Um, <laughs> until then, there, there's really nothing that you can do uh, outside of that. The NFL does an amazing job of presenting its product. It protects its product and it tells the stories of its players uh, in a unique way. The NFL is not hurting for many things right now, but the media who cover it and the media who cover other sports uh, around the nation are hurting right now. And I wish that wasn't happening. All right. Yeah, yeah I definitely feel you on that. We'll add NFL commissioner, uh, track and field, uh, play-by-play <laughs> caller, and a Hollywood star to your uh, your future resume. RG3, thanks so much for joining us on the show. I uh, appreciate you guys. God bless. That's it for today. Before you go on to the next part of your day, take a few seconds to hit that review button on your podcast app or send this episode to a Commander's fan. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.